Okay, thank you. So first of all, I'd like to also like to uh, thank the organizers for setting up this this uh, great event. So my talk will be on on mathematical structuralism or the structuralist uh, thesis in in uh, mathematics, and more specifically on the notion of structural properties uh, and their role in in, in, in this particular uh, uh, philosophy of mathematics. So I. I should say that this is joint work with a colleague, a former colleague of mine, Johannes Korkmacher from the uh, MCMP in, in, in Munich. So whenever I say we or refer to us, I mean, I mean Johannes and, and me. And I also uh, have to say that this is still work in, 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 in progress, so we would be grateful for, for any kind of, uh, kinds of comments on this. So here is a brief, uh, a brief uh, outline of the talk. I will say a little bit about structuralism, uh, what it is, uh, and then a little bit more uh, on what structural properties are and what role they play in this uh, philosophical position. And then the second point would be the main uh, uh, part of the talk. And here, uh, the idea is to outline or suggest two ways to make the notion of structural properties precise. That's basically the, the, the main aim of the, of, the, of the paper and of the talk. And then thirdly, uh, we make some uh, brief remarks uh, in terms of a comparison between these two explications of, of structural properties. In particular, we look at the question whether uh, these two are equivalent. So these the two uh, explications that I'm going to present, whether they are equivalent, whether they determine the same uh, a pre-theoretical concept of structural properties in mathematics? And the question will be no. <laughs> <laughs> so, the structural, starting with the first point, the structuralism in philosophy of mathematics has a long and interesting uh, prehistory in, in, in mathematics. Uh, th this is well known, I guess. So, of particular importance is, is the the rise and development of, of modern formal axiomatics in, in work by Hilbert, Dedekind, uh, Piano, and others. And this has, and it's, or it's often said that this has led to a, a structuralist conception of the discipline or of the subject matter of, of axiomatic theories. So structuralism, roughly put, is the view that mathematical theories describe abstract structures or are about abstract structures or that the content of mathematical theories is purely structural in, in, in character. And as is well known in the, uh, there is an, an intensive uh, literature that goes back to uh, Benazareff's uh, article uh, from 1965. And in this philosophical literature, that these two families of, of theories that try to spell out the, the possible ontological implications of this, uh, this of the structural list thesis in mathematics. And the one is uh, the one family, the first family of theories, is usually uh, labeled non-eliminative structuralism. And this includes work by Michael Resnick, Stuart Shapiro, also Oystein to a certain degree. And recently there's been work by Hannes Leitkip on a, a, a graph theoretically approach to against structuralism. So this is the first, roughly the first uh, family. And the second uh, family of uh, theories is usually labeled uh, eliminative structuralism. And this is uh, basically, this consists of theories that are non-realist or nominalist about abstract structures. And there are different, different. Uh, this comes in different versions, so there's one position that's uh, has been has been uh, labeled relative uh, structuralism. Then there are universal set theoretic versions, and then there is Hellman's uh, modal version of, of, of eliminative structuralism. And this is a paper by uh, Eric Dreck and Richard Price that gives a, a really nice overview and classification of the of the different uh, positions. So here is just to give you one 
one quote. This is from uh, Shapiro's uh, book from uh, 1997. So he uh, describes the position as follows. He says, mathematics is the deductive study of structures. Uh, the mathematician gives a description of the structure in question independently of any systems the structure may be the structure of. So this is, um, this is clearly a, a version of uh, uh, a non-eliminative approach. He calls it an anti rent structuralism, where, where abstract structures are conceived as, as universals. And the idea is that these universals exist as bona fide objects, that is, as independently of the particular set theoretic representations or models that actually uh, satisfy a, a theory. And in contrast, in, in versions of eliminative structuralism, Tilchley held that mathematic, mathematicians do speak about structure, structures, but this is uh, merely a way to generalize over all the set uh, theoretic representations or set theoretic models or systems of a theory. So this is one, one approach would be, so the, the universalist approach would say that talk about structures is basically general, a, a means to generalize over models. And there, there is a, a relativist approach that would cash out this generality in terms of arbitrary uh, reference to models. So the, the relativist structuralist would say that talk about structures is talk about one particular but arbitrarily chosen model. So this is more or less well known. Um, the interesting uh, thing for us is that there exists a second, uh, second alternative way to, to characterize this uh, thesis in, in mathematics, one that also uh, can be found in, in Benassara, for instance. And one that is neutral with respect to these two ontological theories about what structures actually are. And this is basically to claim that mathematics study a particular kind of properties, a particular kind of mathematical property, namely structural properties. And they only study structural properties. So there might be other properties of mathematical objects, but mathematics is really only concerned with structural properties. So in the case of number theory, for instance, uh, the view here is that theories of the natural numbers, for instance, piano arithmetic, uh, do not describe numbers as, as specific sets, as Benassar's point, basically. But rather, they describe properties uh, concerning how numbers add up, how they can be divided, and so on. Okay, and this, as I as I said, this uh, has been uh, this this focus on, on, on structural properties can be found in in Benassar's paper. There is again a, a, a nice quote from a paper uh, of Oystein's paper from two thousand eight, where he says, "Structuralism is the view that pure mathematics is the investigation of abstract structures." And all that matters to mathematics is purely structural properties of objects. And this is, um, I, I think, one has to, to add here. This is uh, uh, give, uh, this this description is uh, given against the background of a non-eliminative uh, uh, version of structuralism. But you also find a similar point made in Hellman's approach to a similar informal characterization made in Hellman's work on an eliminative approach to structures. So he, Hellman says, this is from his, his book, he says, on the structuralist view, the mathematicians claims knowledge of structural relationships on the basis of proofs from assumptions that are frequently, so proofs from axioms that are frequently taken as stipulative of the sort of structures one means to be investigating. And interestingly, the, this focus on structural properties has a long history as well. So here's one of the, the earliest 
passages I could find. Uh, it's, this is a passage uh, written by Carnap roughly in, in 1928 in his uh, lecture notes on, on the philosophy of geometry. So it's, it's, this is not published, it's, it's from Carnap's Nautilus. And Carnap gives an informal description of axiomatics, and he says, an axiom, oops, I'm sorry. So this is AS, just means axiom system. An axiom system defines one or several structures of a relational system. And by structures, he means basically isomorphism classes of models here. And then he says the theorems, what he calls Leersätze, determine structural properties of that system that follow from the definition that is the axiom system. So it has the focus on, on this specific kind of property goes back uh, a, long, a long way. Okay, so so much for background motivation. The point we, uh, Johannes and I, uh, want to make in the paper is to give, make this notion a bit more precise. So st structural properties are usually only characterized or often only characterized informally in the literature. There exists little, there exists some, but not, not, not a lot of systematic work on how they should be understood. And the aim here will be to give two, to suggest two explications of, of the notion. And we will, uh, in the paper, we, we dub them the, the invariance account and the definability account of structural properties. And before saying, stating what they are, some, some preliminary points are, are, are in order. The first, the first one concerns the question how we describe mathematical objects, what, what framework we choose. And our choice is pretty traditional here. So we, work, we are going to work in a traditional model theoretic setting here. There are other frameworks, uh, Steve, for instance, uh, category theory, uh, but that's not what, what we uh, uh, do in, in this paper. The second preliminary point uh, concerns the question what, opt, what we take as mathematical objects here. Uh, and so the, the background motivation is to give a unified or general account of what structural properties uh, are. And we, uh, we, we look at two different kinds of mathematical objects or more precisely, two different ways of representing mathematical objects. So we say that we make the distinction between structured objects, such as number systems, graphs, uh, groups, and so on, and atoms or unstructured objects, such as numbers, vertices, vectors, that usually live in, in one of these uh, structured objects. And this distinction is not um, a, a, a strong ontological one, it's not, not one between ontological types, but it's really context dependent. So the same object can in one context occur as structured and in, the other, in another context uh, occur as an uh, atomic object. To give you just one, one uh, example, consider the, uh, a group and the, uh, the lattice of its subgroups. If we view G as a, as a group, then it's clearly a structured object. But if you uh, view it as an element in this lattice, then it's, a, it's an atom. So this distinction between atoms and, and systems is, is, is a relative one, context-dependent one. So here's, as I said, I, we, we do things in a, in, a, in a set theoretic or model theoretic framework. Here is how we represent structured objects. And basically what we do is we say that uh, a type of such structured object systems, for instance groups, number systems, is defined by a set of axioms and formulated in an associated language with a given uh, theoretical sig uh, signature. And we t take systems to be 
models uh, of that language that uh, satisfy the, the axioms in question. So when, whenever we speak of systems or structured objects, we basically mean models uh, uh, of a given theory, and we take a math mathematical type to be a model class of a given theory. And given that we have a formal language to, uh, uh, <coughs> for this, uh, to describe this, uh, uh, these systems, we can specify in a precise way uh, when two such systems uh, are isomorphic. This is this is unusual. Right? So that's for that's for systems. On the on the side of atoms, we'll present unstructured objects simply as members in the domain of such a given model. So systems are models of a given theory. Objects, atoms are objects in the domain of such a system. Here's a, I mean, this is easy enough, I guess. Take the example of groups. That's clearly a, a structured, a structured thing. A triple consisting of a set, a group operation, and a neutral element in that set, and the natural numbers in, in the natural number structure are atoms. Okay, so there's much about what we think is objects here. How, how can we think about mathematical properties or properties of mathematical objects? And in, in the paper, or in the, in the draft of the paper, we try to say as little as possible about the metaphysical status of, of properties. So we try to uh, remain neutral with this respect. We simply say that properties are those things that you can attribute or predicate of, of, of things. And we will, in the following, distinguish between uh, properties of atoms and properties of systems. For instance, a property of being prime is a property of atoms, numbers in the number system. A property uh, of uh, having an infinite domain is a property of systems. If push, so when we need to be more precise, we make the distinction between uh, an extensional and an in, the distinction between an extension and an intention of properties. And as the extension of a property, we simply take the the set of all that uh, things of all the things that that have that property. So the extension of a property of, of atoms is a set of atoms, and the extension of a property of systems is a set of systems. That's the, that's the extensional side. It's a bit more difficult to say what the intention of a property of mathematical uh, object is, so it looks like. Roughly, it's that thing that allows us to identify a property in, in different contexts. So, in the, in the present context, we we understand by an intention basically a, a Lewisian understanding. We say that uh, the intention of a property is simply a function from context to extensions. So in the case of uh, atoms, this can be made a bit more precise in the following way. So we have a, a property P of atoms, then the extension is just uh, the, the set of elements in that system th that had the property, and the, and the intention of that property is a function from the system to a subset of the domain of that system, a function that assigns to every system of type T uh, a particular extension uh, of P uh, in S. And dually, one can Give the same, uh, same, same, same uh, account of properties for for systems. So let P be a property of systems. For instance, a, a property of, of, of graphs. So think of the property of being a complete graph. For instance, the extension is simply a set of graphs, and the intention of a property, more generally speaking, is a function from mathematical types to 
subsets of these types, that is two model classes. And that's a function that assigns to every type an extension of P in that type P. Okay, so that much about... It's just taking place within set theory, or... So all these things aren't necessarily steps. Yeah, that's true. But, so where, where is it taking place? Uh, we don't... We are not explicit about this. So, okay. yeah, yeah, it's true that these, yeah. these are usually classes. True. Yeah. Okay, so we said what objects are, what we take uh, properties of mathematical objects to be, what are structural properties informally. So the idea is here to give a to give, before turning to the to the two explications that we propose, the idea is to give us a kind of informal specify a, a couple of informal criteria that will then show give us the means to show whether the explication is the explications that we look at are materially adequate with respect to this pre theoretical understanding of structural properties, and informally. I guess one can say that the structural property is a property of a mathematical object that the object has in virtue or because of its structure. And this means, of course, this means different uh, things uh, for systems and atoms. So in the first case, we can say that the structural property of a system that is a structured object it's a property that the system has because of its internal structural composition. So think again of, uh, of, of graphs, for instance. Uh, the property of having a certain number of edges or, or being a complete graph says something about the internal composition of the graph. And in the case of atoms, we would say that the structural property is uh, a property an object has because of the relational structure or the contextual structure that that atom has with respect to the other objects in that system. The, the examples discussed in, in, in uh, Benassar's paper uh, really fit in nicely here. So being prime is a structural property of the natural numbers where it's being a certain set a number being a certain set is not. Having infinitely many, infinitely many prime numbers is a structural property of the natural number systems, whereas having the sequence of the von Neumann sets is, uh, as the numbers is not. Okay, so that much for uh, uh, preliminary uh, remarks. Now, let's turn to the two two suggestions how to specify this notion. There exist, if you look at the, at the literature in structuralism, there exist two ways to, uh, two, two approaches how to specify the notion. And we will follow them, we're taking the starting point. The first one, that's again Oysten's paper, uh, <coughs> is the idea to define uh, these properties in terms of abstraction or in terms of invariance. So the idea is to say that the property is structural if it's shared by every other system that instantiates the, the same structure. So a property of an object is structural if for any other object that instantiates the same mm -hmm. structure as the first object, the property holds also of that second, uh, of that second object. So this is the, the, the first uh, account, and the second account is in terms of definability. This is found in, in, in work by Shapiro, but also in uh, uh, work by Kevin, for instance. And here, the idea is simply to define structural properties as those properties uh, that are definable in a given uh, uh, formal language. Okay, so how can we, how can we how can we uh, start from here? The first, the first, let's, the first, first account is the, the, the so-called invariance account. And uh, if you look at, at the history, uh, 
there is an interesting that the first explicit formulation of, 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 of this definition of structural properties can, can be found in, 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 in Kanov's work. So this is a, a quote from a, a, an unpublished manuscript. It's called Untersuchungen uh, zur Allgemeinen Axiomatik, written around 1928 and then published posthumously in, in 2000. And kind of gives here an, a definition of structural properties for relations generally. And what he says is basically this, so it's a definition. The property f of p of relations is called the structural property if in case it applies to, applies to relation p, it also applies to any other relation isomorphic to p. And then he goes on to say the structural properties so construed are the invariants on the isomorphic uh, transformation. They have central importance to mathematics. And we call that the, 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 the earlier passage that I quoted, where I kind of said that theorems basically investigate the structural properties that, that follow from, from an axiom system. So this is the, the, the kind of background here. Well, this is defined for relations generally, and, and given our discussion of two types of, two ways of representing mathematical objects, we want to get an invariance account for both systems and atoms. So the first way, to, the first, first uh, proposal is this one. This is for uh, an explication of, of structural properties for, for systems of a given uh, uh, mathematical type. And it's really simple. Basically, we say that property is a structural property of systems of a given type T. If for any two systems in T, if P holds of S and the two are isomorphic, that is, there exists an isomorphism between them, then P also holds of uh, S prime. So structural properties so construed are simply those properties that remain invariant under the isomorphism of a, of a system of that type. What about the, 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 uh, the, the second type of object, atoms or unstructured objects? How can we, how can we uh, specify an invariance account of structural properties for those? Well, one possible approach here would be to look at invariance with respect to one specific domain or uh, one specific model, so to speak. That is, to look at invariance under the automorphisms uh, uh, of a given model. So this, would, this is one possible way to go here. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not the approach we will uh, su suggest, but that's, that's one candidate. The idea is simply to say that the property of objects in a given system, A, is a structural property if P is invariant in A, that is, for every automorphism uh, on A, the property uh, remains invariant with respect to that uh, automorphism function. The problem with this account is that it doesn't seem to give us uh, materially adequate. That, that property is extensionally uh, understood, the identity of property. The yeah. 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 This doesn't. This doesn't seem to work, and uh, or doesn't. It turns out that this makes property structural that we wouldn't want to call structural informally or pre-theoretically. And one important class of examples here are properties of individuals of rigid uh, 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 systems that is systems without non-trivial uh, automorphisms. That is systems where the only automorphism is the based on the identity uh, function. So take the natural numbers here, the real number field, the cumulative hierarchy of sets. In each of these cases, any, every possible, any, any, any property conceived extension. It turns out to be a structural property, and clearly we don't want that. So take, for instance, uh, Gödel's favorite numbers. That, that, that would turn out as a structural property. For in, in, 
with respect to these systems. So this is clearly, from a philosophical point of view, undesirable. The alternative suggestion, on, and the best suggestion we have come up so far, is to look also in the case, also in, in the case of uh, non-structured objects, to look at invariants uh, across domains. So the um, the suggestion uh, we've come up so far with is, is this one. So take uh, a system S of a given type, and then a property of uh, atoms in S is called structural. If for all other systems of uh, other systems of type T and all possible isomorphisms between uh, such systems. It's the case that for all objects in, in the domain of S, if P holds of X, then P holds also uh, of the isomorphic copy uh, of X in system S uh, prime. So the idea here is to define structural properties of atoms in a given system as the properties that the atoms keep when we make uh, isomorphic copies of that system. Okay, so this is the so much for the the two ways to think about uh, structural properties according to the invariance account. And one nice feature of this is that uh, it agrees with many uh, of our informal uh, uh, intuitions about what structural properties in mathematics are. So, for instance, all of the Benazirov examples turn out to be. Uh, Structural uh, under this account. So the examples uh, were mentioned before, having infinitely many prime numbers, turns out to be a structural properties, uh, structural property of PA system, being prime structural properties of numbers in PA systems, and the cases which we would not consider as structural properties turn out to be non non invariant. Okay. Furthermore, there are a couple of um, conceptual points to, to, to mention here, uh, specifically in, in relation to Carnap's uh, or original, very general uh, formulation of, the, of the, this principle. The first one is that this both invariance accounts only give us a, a, a relative or a, a partial definition of structural properties relative to a given uh, type of mathematical object, so relative to a given uh, theory, basically. And the account is also non-reductive uh, in the sense that it presupposes what we mean by isomorphism, or, or what we mean by the fact that there exists an isomorphism, two, two objects of the, this type are isomorphic. Thus, the account is highly sensitive to how we present or represent objects, what type of languages we associate with them, and so on. So it's, it's relative to, to the way we represent theories and, and objects. OK, I'm not doing with time. OK, you go until 25 past. 25, OK. Um, OK, so that much for uh, the, the invariance account. Now, there isn't, uh, in the, in the, what we tried to do in the paper is, uh, and this is where, really where the, the work in, in progress, unfortunately, still, still comes in, is we, we also tried to give a more philosophical uh, or metaphysical explanation of why structural properties so construed turn out to be structural in the, in the informal sense of why, they are, why these properties are structural. And at least for the invariance account, one way to go here is to think of this invariance approach in, in relation to a theory of aboutness, being about the structure of mathematical objects. So the idea, so the question is how does the invariance account capture the intuition that structural properties are properties <coughs> grounded in structure, or, or property, or properties an object has because of its structure. 
uh, one of the, the accounts of, of metaphysical aboutness that is discussed in the literature goes back to, to this paper uh, by uh, Lewis from 1988. And basically, Lewis' uh, theory of aboutment uh, is this. It holds that it's, it's, so it's formulated in a, in a possible world framework, and it states that a, a, a statement is about a subject matter if the truth value of that statement uh, supervenes on a given subject matter. That is, if the truth value stays the same at any two possible worlds that are indistinguishable with respect to a given subject matter. So, informal example, if you take the subject matter to be uh, the color, color of, of the balls, then the statement the ball is blue would uh, turn out to be true in any two worlds that are indistinguishable with respect to the subject matter color of the ball. Whereas the statement the ball is blue is not about uh, the subject matter, the material of the ball. So how does, um, here's a, a quote uh, from Lewis that helps to uh, elucidate a bit, I hope, to, to, to see what he means by subject matters and, and aboutness. So he says, this is from the, uh, this is from the, sorry to go back, this is from this paper, 1988. So he says that a proposition or a sentence is about the subject matter uh, if the truth value of the proposition supervenes on that subject matter. And what does he take subject matters to be? He gives different accounts of how to understand them. One is in terms of equivalence relations on the class of, of, of models or worlds. Another one goes related to that one is in terms of the uh, partitions given by, uh, on, on, on a class of words given by an equivalence relation. So he says here, quote, when we think of the subject matter, when we think of subject matters as partitions, we can say that P is about M if and only if each cell of M either implies or contradicts P. And these cells are uh, 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 cells in an um, equivalent partition. So subject matters are basically equivalences or equivalence relations or the partitions uh, induced by them. And so the idea that Johannes and I uh, have originally had is to use this framework and to apply it in the context of, in, in our context of how to think about uh, mathematical objects. And the idea is roughly this. So we restrict our uh, attention to mathematical statements and simply take possible worlds to be models of a, of a given theory or uh, graphs in the space of graphs, for instance. And then we can get a Lewisian account of what a mathematical subject matter or a subject matter of a given mathematical space or class of object is. And it's basically, as I said, it's an equivalence relation or a partition uh, of models in the sense that uh, for all statements of that language L, phi is about the subject matter M if and only if uh, for any two models that are equivalent with respect to the subject methods, uh, phi is true in M if and only if it's true also in, in M. So this is basically Lewis, Lewis's idea. And our idea now, but still we still haven't worked it out sufficiently enough, so it's really a sketch uh, that, that I present here. The idea is that you can take you can look at a specific subject matter in mathematics, and this is simply the, the, the isomorphism relation, or the partition given by the isomorphism relation, and you could you can be inclined to call that the structure of a given given uh, 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 of, of the objects of a given given mathematical type. And then we can it's an easy uh, consequence of the way. Uh, this notion of aboutness is set up and the invariance account specified above that a statement that expresses uh, an, an invariant property of a given type is turned out to be about 
the structure, the isomorphism partitioning of a given uh, space of, of objects T, if and only if it is uh, a structural property according to the invariance account. So there seems to be a nice uh, equivalence between Lewis' metaphysical picture and the, the invariance based specification of what structural properties are. Okay. So, turning to the to the second point, the the uh, definability account. Interestingly, this is also a, 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 a prehistory, a history that predates the the modern debate on structuralism. So you can one one. Uh, place where uh, structural properties or formal properties are specified in terms of definability is, is also in, in, in Carnap's work, but here not in the this Untersuchungen manuscript on, on the axiomatic methods, but in the Aufbau. So here is what, what Carnap has to say about formal properties of relations, and he means by that structural properties uh, in the Aufbau, he says, by formal properties of a relation, we mean those that can be formulated without reference to the meaning of the relation and the type of objects between it holds. The formal properties can be defined exclusively with the aid of logistic symbols, logic symbols, that is ultimately with the aid of the few fundamental symbols which form the basic of logistics or symbolic logic. And one should add here that what logistics means to Carnap at the time is basically a higher or a strong higher order theory, so basically a version of simple type theory. Okay, so it's not what we would usually call logic today. So how can we how can we uh, translate this idea into two accounts of structural properties for? Uh, systems and, and atoms or unstructured objects. Well, the first approach is the first first approach concerns uh, a definability account for systems, and basically this is again fairly easy. We say that the pro a property P is a structural properties of systems of again of a given type. If there is a closed formula in the language of T such that the extension of P is defined by this closed formula. So structural properties of systems of a type are properties whose extension is definable in, in the language of that type. And a, a similar approach uh, can be given for, for, for atoms. So we say that Take a system S uh, of a given type. A property P is a structural property of the objects of atoms in S. If there is an open formula in that language, such that uh, the extension of P in S is defined uh, by that open formula, is definable by that open formula. So structural properties of atoms in this sense, relative to a given systems, are just those properties whose extension in the given system is definable in the language of that type. Okay, so these are the two. These are the two proposals. Uh, as in the as with the invariance account, the uh, these definitions seem to capture quite well our informal uh, in intuitions about, about what these properties are. So here again, the, all of the Benazirov examples turn out as structural according to this approach. All of the counter examples turn out as non-structural. <clears throat> and as the invariance account, this approach is partial and non-reductive because it has to be specified. It's specified relative to uh, a, a given type of objects and relative to a given uh, uh, given language in which we describe these objects. So it's sensitive, highly sensitive to how we represent objects linguistically, but the main or the, uh, 
an important difference to the invariance account is that in addition to that, it also depends, as I will see in a second, it also depends strongly on the, the expressive power of the logical background language that we are uh, using. That is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a closely dependent on the logical strength of the, of the, of the language that we're using. Okay. So at this point, I should give you, uh, as in the invariance account, I should give you a, a, a kind of more metaphysical story why properties, structural properties, so defined, turn out to be structural. But we we had one, but it didn't work out. So I cannot <laughs> offer you <laughs> anything here. Uh, so the idea was to, to five minutes, yeah. The idea was to. Uh, give an explanation in terms of truth making and truth maker models, but yeah, not, didn't work out. So no, no metaphysical story here. Okay, so finally, just some points of, of comparison. So it seems like an interesting approach would be to characterize the structuralist thesis in mathematics by saying that Structural properties. Uh, mathematics is really only about structural properties, but then you would have to specify what these type of properties really are. And then the question is, do these two uh, explications really give us the same uh, pre-theoretic notion, informal notion of what structural properties in mathematics are? And this seems, on, on first hand, and 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 plausible assumption to make. There is a, a, a nice symmetry between definability and the invariance. Here's a, a quote from uh, Hodge's book on, on model theory. I, I, I won't read it, but this, and it's it's also not directly uh, applicable to our account because Hodge's is talking about structure uh, uh, invariance and the automorphisms. But basically, so the the, the, the the motto here is that these two seem to point in the in the, in its there is to add the or a symmetry between nice symmetry between invariance and definability. So the question is, are these two equivalent? These two approaches? Well, and they are not. Um, the one direction from definability to invariance is straightforward. That's, that's, it's basically, a, 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 it follows from the, the isomorphism uh, lemma in model theory. So what you get is definability, uh, the result that you get is all definable properties are uh, invariant in either one of our uh, senses. But the other direction doesn't hold general, that's, that's the problem. So. Uh, just to give you uh, one example, the property of first or the PA systems of being isomorphic to the natural number system, that's clearly not definable in the first order the setting, uh, but it's invariant on the isomorphisms of PA systems. Now you could think that you could uh, kind of restore the match if you move up uh, the, the, the logical level letter to, to high order language, but it turns out that there are also uh, quite technical examples of invariant properties that are not definable in second order languages. So there's a paper, actually a couple of papers by, by Benjamin that construct such examples. And then there is an interesting limit case which we haven't looked enough yet, so I cannot really say, say much about it. Uh, and this is the fact that in a limit, in a certain limit case, namely definability in infinitary languages, the equivalent seems to be restored again. So if you think of definability in terms of definability in, in infinitary languages, all invariant properties also become definable and, and vice versa. Do you have two minutes? Um, okay, so the two are not, the two are not are not equivalent. So the two, they do not determine the same, the same intuitive notion. The question is where, where, where to go from here. And one possible approach would be to say, well, just 
choose one, choose the invariance account or the definability account and then work with that. But the problem about this, this philosophical move is that uh, there are counterexamples to, to philosophical counterexamples and mathematical counterexamples to both approaches. So one fact that uh, <coughs> Can be can be can be shown is that the invariance account tends to uh, over generate, so it uh, makes properties structural. So properties turn out as structural according to this approach that we wouldn't pre theoretically take as as such, uh, uh, or, or they turn out structural for the wrong reason. So one example we we look at in the paper are uh, so-called parasitic properties, that is properties that are parasitic on the isomorphism relation that you have defined for a given type. For instance, the property of being, uh, the property of being such that there is a non-isomorphic system to a given system, that's really structural according to the variance account, but uh, it's not structural because of the internal, for internal reason of the, of the system, but it's structural because of the existence of something else, another model in that case. So, the invariance account tends to overgenerate the um, uh, definability account, uh, as we saw, tends to, to undergenerate. So, depending on the, the strength of the background language that you adopt, there always are properties that you would informally characterize as structural that turn out to be non-definable non -definable in that language. Being isomorphic to the natural number system was, was one, one such example. Okay? And this is basically it. So here's a, here's a conclusion, or it's basically a, a to-do list, stuff that we want to look at in the future. One thing, there is a striking analogy between uh, the debate on, on logical invariance approaches to logicality or to logical constants, for instance, in, in work by Bonet, and it would be interesting to look at possible connections between this work and ways to characterize structural properties in, in, in philosophy of mathematics. Then, as I said in the beginning, model theory might not be the only and possibly not even the, the best framework to go here. So one point that Steve Audi has suggested numerous times is that this new univalent uh, project gives a, a kind of solution for the mismatch between invariance and the definability. So definability in a homotopy type theory uh, gives you exactly the definable properties, but we haven't worked on that at all. And the, the final thing is, is more philosophical, and that's the question, how do you go from the fact that um, these two explications do not coincide or do not give you the same, same pre-theoretical notion? Uh, one possible approach here would be, to go back to Carnap, would be to adopt the kind of Canapian tolerant approach here and say, well, depending on the context and what you're interested in, sometimes better to, to adopt an invariance based account and in other cases where you look for a more trackable account of what structural properties are, it's, it's better to look at the first order or second order definable properties. And yeah, and that's it. Thanks. On your conclusions, you have those two points. Can you put them back? Yeah, sure. They are extremely related, the one of the logicality point and the second one. And all the time I was listening to those thinking of these two things, yeah. and it's nice that you mentioned. So I've looked also quite a bit into the logicality debate, and my conclusion was that uh, it's, it's not a good idea to go down this way because model theory is hopeless when it comes to describing structure. Right? It's very poor to describe structure. And then whenever you get a case of logics that are somehow related to structural properties of the models, that they're, they're, they're the underlying models, say modal logics, things start to break down with the usual invariance criteria for logicality. Right? So that is directly related.
related to your second point, which is the new sanitary, and perhaps a mobile model theory isn't even the best framework, technical framework to work with this. And I would say it really probably is not, because it's not about structure, and, and you're trying to talk about structure. So there's a mismatch, uh, which is not to say that model theory cannot talk about structure, can be made to talk about structure, you've shown us. But it's not what it's meant to do in the first place. And then it gets a bit strained along the way. And maybe some of the, the difficulties that you run into are related to that, which are very similar to difficulties in precisely in the logicality debate. Whereas, you know, if you get something like category theory, which is about structure in the first place, that might, but I, on the other hand, of course, I understand why you would take, take model theory as your framework. Because, well, you know, that's what we work with. Right? It's a very you know, widely accepted technical framework to do these things. But there is this difficulty with handling structure that I, I view as inherent to all the theory. And so. Uh, yeah, so um, if I, I don't, it might perfectly be true that, that uh, 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 category theory or this human foundation project is, is more more adequate framework for, for doing this. And I think basically this recent paper published by, by Steve, so this is the Philosophia Mathematica mm -hmm. paper on in there, in the univalence axiom yeah. and structuralism um, gives, so to speak, a first outline of how, how, how this would look like. And, but, and I cannot say more about this. I mean, one, one interesting uh, thing is that is is precisely this symmetry that you find described in Hodges, right? So the, the symmetry between, uh, in, in his case, it's, it's set theoretic definability and, and uh, invariance and, uh, and our, uh, automorphisms. And this has, I think to a large degree, this has motivated the, the work, on, so, or this symmetry has motivated much of the work on, on, on logical constants, on, on, on logicality. So I think uh, these papers by um, Denis Bonnet, for instance, uh, try to use exactly these modern theoretic ideas to... to but, but then there are all kinds of, all kinds of cases of over-generation and under-generation, and then they yeah, yeah, take yeah. fix-ups yeah. for that, yeah. and things get complicated. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to say uh, there's an obvious sociological reason why you should do what you're doing, namely because model theory is this framework that we all know and love, and so it makes perfect sense from this perspective. But it's just that I have the feeling you know, we constantly encounter these problems that have to do with you know not having enough resources to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this might this might perfectly be true. So for for us right now, one one interesting thing is exactly to see what these two, you know, I'll, encounter I'll the, you, the, the problems paper. here and see how the, the older generation uh, problems there relate to our encounter. And yeah. So, but it might be true that this is ultimately not the best way to go. Yeah. Uh, just a curiosity on the metaphysics bit. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I get it right, your account of structural properties wants to be neutral between eliminative and non eliminative accounts. So, it, in, at least in principle, you must allow for non exemplified instantiated structures. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, my question is, is about the metaphysics. Uh, uh, and the grounding relation you have between structures and structural properties. Uh, what would you reply, would, you, would, would your position be compatible and maybe should your position be compatible with the reverse notion of grounding to someone that says, look, there are uh, properties, I allow for non-instantiated properties, um, these are universals or whatever, uh, they can combine, and uh, it is structures that are grounded on structural properties and not structural properties which are grounded in structures. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I would have to think about that. I cannot. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe this helps. But so, I, 
in, in this paper, at least, we, we try to be as, as neutral as possible with respect to um, whether to assume a non eliminativist account or an eliminativist account. And structural properties occur in, as I, as I said, they occur in the different debates. So you, you find them in, in, in eliminativism, but you also find them in, in there's discussion on structural properties as the properties pure abstracted structures yeah. have. So I think this is, if I understood it correctly, the, the main idea of the recent paper of you and, and, and Richard Pettigrew is the idea to define abstraction principles that give you kind of purified, anti uh, uh, not anti game structures, but sui generis structures, and then look at the properties of the objects in these structures. Um, about this point, I, I cannot give you a, I have, but it's a good, thanks. Uh, have to think about it. Yeah. Right, yeah, um, I thought this was really nice and, and really useful to distinguish between these two ways of, of thinking about the structural property. Uh, nice, nice gloss on the invariance of the integrals and the values. So just two, two, two observations. One is concerning your use of the uh, Beninin result, mm -hmm. where it looks like you could have a much simpler argument to, uh, to the same effect. Oh, that's that's just based yeah. on yeah. cardinality considerations. Yeah. Right? So for any subset of the, uh, the naturals, being a member of that is a structural property. Right? And there are uncountable many of those. And in your second of the language, there are just countable many yeah. uh, things that okay. can be So no need to. Uh, to be fancy. Okay, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think we've looked at these cardinality arguments at some point, but then we dropped it. But that's excellent. excellent. Yeah. But um, sort of more substantively, um, you, you had the overgeneration uh, consideration at the, at the very end. So yeah. being, being a system such that there is a non isomorphic system. Um, and here it looks to me like you, you really need to look at how the properties in question are to be intermediated and, and be more specific about that. Since if they're intermediated sufficiently coarse grained, then uh, this is just the trivial property. And uh, that's true of, of any other system. So there's no, and that's, that should be perfectly structural. The, the, the property that's pretty true of, of all of them. Uh, and there's a problem only if you individual properties very, very, in a very, very fine-grained way. But that would just push in the direction of something more like the definability uh, uh, approach anyway. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, so the idea is, I think that the, the, the idea was that such a property, we wouldn't Call such a property structural informally mm -hmm. because given the so what, what we said at the beginning is we take informally we take properties of, of systems mm -hmm. uh, as structural if they are about mm -hmm. the internal composition of, of an object, mm -hmm. right? So and these things turn out to be structural for reasons external mm -hmm. to to a given system. So that, that was the I, well, my, my point is that if, if properties are individuated in a sufficiently coarse grained way, yep. then this property is just like the property of being such, a, such that the topology holds. Right? Okay. And, and that's, I don't see what's so bad about calling that structure. Right? So that's looking at the internal articulation of the system and demanding nothing of that. Yeah. So that's yeah. a limit yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. Of, of the phenomenon that, yeah. you, that you do want. So this is bad only if you want your properties to be individuated in a very fine way. Okay. But if that is your concern, you probably ought to have been attracted to the divided value. Okay, thanks a lot for this. I have to think about this. Thanks. Yes, I have a two, two worries. I don't know whether they are relevant or not. But the first one is about your distinction between atoms yeah. and the structural object. It seems to me that there are cases in which uh, the elements uh, of a, a structure have a structural relation in the sense of the relation with uh, 
rather element of the structure, because of the internal property they have, not because of the atom. I take an example. When Frager defines uh, the domain of management, he defines them as a structure, but the structure, the relation to the structure, depends on the fact that the elements are binary relations and depend on the structure of the binary relation. They are not simply treated as atoms, are treated as uh, uh, binary relations that have certain uh, uh, property uh, because of the fact that they are binary relations. This is the first uh, one. The second uh, concerns your insistence of isomorphism. I'm not sure that isomorphism is the good relation. This is quite clear, according to me, for non, uh, non, uh, um, in, in, in case, uh, uh, for example, if you have the the, 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 the the case of groups, you can have two groups, and you would like to say that they share the proper the, the structure of groups. But of course, two groups are not necessarily isomorphic. So, but even in the case of uh, uh, of second order uh, theories uh, where, for example, take the example, uh, we want to define a natural number in second order, and you define natural number using axioms that do not include addition and multiplication, and, but we would like to say that they define the same structure that are defined by axioms where uh, multiplication and addition are not defined but are in the axioms. So in this case, you have not uh, necessarily isomorphism uh, with respect to the axiom, but it's intu intuitive. Uh, you say intuitively, you say that yeah. you are defining the same structure. Yeah. So I'm not sure that yeah. isomorphism. I mean, is so I think this 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 uh, topic comes up in the structuralist debate. Yeah, uh, exactly. In, in, and the Shapiro, in fact, does not use uh, does not use isomorphism, isomorphism so as I think, a condition. Yeah. It comes up in, in I think it comes up first in, in, in Michael Resnick's book, yes, yes, yes. and a more general equivalence relation. Uh, and I have no objections against that, so it's 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 a good point. I think this is something one could look at. I mean, for us, the basic motivation is was to look at the most obvious case of the invariance, and that's invariance. And, and, and look, we should be a trait only of categorical structure. Let's say that isomorphism is not good even for categorical structure. Yeah, but that's a tip. So we, we want to have a more, I mean, we okay. want to talk about uh, the, the, the basic motivation is to talk about properties of objects that are not described categorically in theory. So yeah. the idea is to. The base, the whole thing came from thinking about uh, graph and uh, graph properties. But so this this is interesting. And but I, another point: isomorphism doesn't have to be the only the the, the only equivalence relation that that invariance is, is specified uh, relation. To. So it might be other might there might be other interesting equivalence relations that we might look at and. This is a true point, yeah. Just a very general. Oh, sorry, uh, no, sorry, there's something else? Okay, fine. That's fine. Sorry. It's okay. Um, it's okay. Fine. So, so let's I take two seen. questions then. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> one minute per question. Uh, yeah, one, for uh, question. one minute per question. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll be, I'll be repeating sort of uh, this remark by Marco and Horton about in the question of cardinality. Yes. I mean, I'm sorry about cardinality. Cardinality. Because isomorphisms uh, require card the same cardinality, and it does not seem to be adequate for, for each other. Right? But on the other hand, I understand that, I understand that you, you need isomorphism because you want to transit from A to B and B to A if they are similar. Right? So my question is, why not to use a pair of homomorphisms? Okay. From A to B and B to A, like sort of a Galois connection, these, I suppose, would be a much better uh, uh, idea of a, how two structures are the same or are related. Oh, yeah. You know? So they'll be avoiding completely the story of cardinality. It does not enter into the discussion, into the game. Just a suggestion. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Everything has to be developed. <laughs> This was just a very general philosophical remark that doesn't require an answer, I think. But it strikes me that there's a kind of philosophically an asymmetry between the 
invariance account and the definability account in that the definability account is clearly only going to be remotely plausible once you've restricted attention to the resources in terms of which definitions are going to be given. Um, the question immediately arises, well, why stop where you, exactly where you stop rather than add in other stuff, which would clearly introduce the possibility of yeah. defining non-structural properties. So it looks as though the, there's a sense in which the invariance account is clearly fundamental and the other at best going to be equivalent to it if you fix the resources for definability in the right kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have to say anything about it, it just seems I mean, like as I, the, the one thing I, I mentioned, and this comes up in this debate on, on, on logical constants, you get the equivalence if the language, uh, assuming a background language, is, is, is rich enough for its yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if, sure. In, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but at that point, yeah. I think to the stress is what you just said. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I think so. so yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, I think that belongs in the same yeah. area. Yeah. I agree. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks.